Christian. Thanks for joining me. Yeah, my pleasure. So you argue that the culture wars are underpinned by economics, or at least that economics has a huge part to play. Um, this certainly may be true when it comes to Black Lives Matter and their neo-Marxist agenda and also Extinction Rebellion and their desire to overthrow capitalism altogether. Um, but is it not the case that we're seeing a broader realignment where issues such as identity, patriotism, culture are simply more important to the electorate than economic concerns? Yes, that's fair to say. The argument that I'm making in that reaction article is not uh, applicable across the spectrum. So I'm specifically talking about the progressive left, the, the woke left, um, where we often think of culture war battles as something that happens outside of economic debates and completely separate from it. Whereas I'm saying, no, if you look at it, uh, there is uh, an underlying economic argument here, an underlying economic premise, even if it's not that well articulated. You could say, right, uh, toppling a statue is not in itself, uh, in an obvious way, an economic argument, or uh, scribbling Churchill was a racist on, on the statue. There's no obvious economics in there. But if you listen to them, if you listen to those activists and their, um, their spokespeople in the media, their, their champions in the mainstream media, if you listen to how they justify it, they are, in a sense, they, they have a particular understanding of how the economy works. Their, their argument in this particular case is that the Western world grew rich through colonialism and slavery. You will have heard this argument that uh, the revenue from the slave trade is what financed the Industrial Revolution. And um, critics have... Uh, often said that, you know, why are you guys so obsessed with the distant past? These are things that happened two centuries ago, nothing we can do about that now. But the thing is, for them, it isn't about the past. They believe that what happened then still shapes the world of today, and, and in particular, economic outcomes. They believe that that is the reason why, for example, some countries are rich and others are poor, or why within countries some groups are richer than others. So that very much is about economic outcomes. Even if it's not always that well articulated, there is an underlying economic narrative that they're telling. And um, the, the statue toppling and the, the vandalizing of memorials and renaming street names and buildings and all that comes into that. They believe that only by doing that, only by, um, by attacking symbols of that colonial past, can you force people to come to terms with, with uh, that legacy and do something about it, rebuild it. So that very much is an economic argument. Um, it's not something that uh, technical economists, say people who work at the Institute for Fiscal Studies or the Office for Budget Responsibility would be hugely interested in, but people who look at big picture economics, who, who, who talk about uh, economic systems on the whole, like us, like the Institute of Economic Affairs, um, we very much have something to say on those matters, and we should. We have to engage with those arguments. But you're right, uh, it's not, uh, if somebody tried to apply the same logic to, to Brexit, there it wouldn't work. It's not true across the board, it's not true across the spectrum. For Brexit, I would agree, that was very much, um, something where economics didn't play much of a role. Uh, it did for some, but it was, more, it was more often that economic arguments were used to hide uh, underlying cultural preferences. So it, it was more the other way around, really, um, rather than having uh, a culture war with underlying economics. There you had supposedly an economic debate, but with an underlying culture war, there it's, it's, it's almost the reverse of what, what I'm talking about. So it's, it's not true across the spectrum. And, uh, but for the progressive left, it very much is. Uh, or, or to sum this up, uh, you, you could just do the, the thought experiment that if you think this has nothing to do with economics, well, imagine you or I turned up at the Black Lives Matter meeting and uh, said to them, 
Uh, you know what? Uh, I believe in, in capitalism. I believe in free markets. We're not going to agree on economics, but I like some of the stuff you do. I want to join you. Would they accept you or would they accept me? Absolutely not. They would, we would be called fascists and get kicked out. So there clearly is something about economics here. So looking more broadly at this phenomenon, the culture wars phenomenon, do you see this as a long-term political realignment? Um, why do you think it's impacting so much of the West? And if you can answer this question, I don't know, but where do you think this frenzied behavior comes from? I know that you have, your theory is that these woke opinions have become uh, high status as compared to low status conservative or, or free market opinion. Yes. Um, yeah, I think the problem is just that uh, for, for progressives have always liked to see themselves as a bit of a moral elite, uh, an enlightened uh, minority in a bigoted society, a society full of bigots, but we're, we're the chosen ones. Um, the problem with that mindset is that by definition, only elites are always small. Uh, we, we can't all be part of the elite. So that means you have a problem when you're a progressive who lives in a society that is broadly socially liberal, a society that is on the whole fairly tolerant, because then how do you distinguish yourself? How do you differentiate yourself from, from the masses if uh, your ideals are actually quite widely shared? And I think that is the problem that uh, progressives in modern Western societies are facing. That uh, certainly a society like Britain, Britain is a fairly socially liberal society. Britain is a fairly tolerant place. Uh, that doesn't mean that there is no place for, for social progressivism, but it would mean that if you are progressive, if you're, if you're socially liberal, you are not somehow a tribe that is apart from mainstream society. It would be more that uh, you share the values of mainstream society and you just go several steps further, but there's nothing that makes you qualitatively different. So if you want to maintain that distinction, you have to find new battlegrounds all the time. And the way this expresses itself uh, in the culture wars in particular is that, that people find, woke people find new offenses all the time. There's barely a, a day that goes by without some other thing that used to be harmless until until today uh, being suddenly problematic being a microaggression or whatever and and i, th I think the, that's for example the the latest example one of the latest example that i've read is that uh, it's it's now problematic if you it's a it's a microaggression if you say to a non-white person that they are articulate why uh, articulate is, a, is, is surely something positive uh, how it, it sounds like a compliment how, how can that be an aggression well the justification for that is that uh, it sounds as though you're saying uh, i was expecting you to be inarticulate and it surprises me so much that that you are actually quite articulate that i uh, feel the need to to mention it uh, of course you, you can always um create and construct offenses in that way if you're specifically looking for it and that is what woke culture warriors are doing but i think this is purely because they have won the main arguments and uh, their main yeah. ideas are mainstream ideas and being woke is about distinction it's woke opinions are status symbols they are a way of signaling i am more more educated more aware i'm i'm a more sophisticated person i'm i'm a morally better person i'm morally superior and uh, therefore if you in order to stay ahead to maintain that mark of distinction you have to find new offenses all the time it's very much like with a counterculture that then becomes mainstream and where the early adopters uh, then get very nervous about this uh, because suddenly they're part of the mainstream and that is the last thing they want to be. They hate to be part of the mainstream. Uh, this is uh, something that I've experienced this as a, as a teenager in the early 90s when suddenly Nirvana was uh, successful and, and had uh, chart success. The early Nirvana fans absolutely hated it. They hated the 
the second wave Nirvana fans because suddenly it was no longer uh, a marker of distinction. It was no longer particularly uh, shocking or progressive um, to be a Nirvana fan because now uh, the whole school was filled with Kurt Cobain lookalikes and therefore uh, they, they lost that marker of distinction and, and, and had to abandon that and somehow find some uh, something more niche and something yeah. <laughs> more extreme style. And this is what ha was happening in the in the sphere of opinions. This is how to make sense of this phenomenon that uh, an opinion that was perfectly fine, perfectly acceptable last week is now suddenly super problematic and, uh, and you can't say that or you will immediately get cancelled. Um, you, you can interpret it and in, you can make sense of it in, in those terms, thinking, thinking of it as a, a status uh, signaling race, an arms race um, where uh, where the, the progressive signal of an opinion quickly gets eroded and you have to jump to, to something else. But on, on your first question of the, of the realignment, um, yeah, I think that's, that's happening. Um, it used to be the case for, for quite a while that um, economics uh, or that, that political clusters, political uh, coalitions were built around economics. If two people agreed on economics, if they had similar views on what sort of economic policies they wanted to see, then we would think of those people as allies, even if they disagree on many other things. That wouldn't matter so much. If you agree on economics, you're part of the same team. Um, we, can, we can see this uh, expressed quite well in the movie Pride. Uh, it came out five or six years ago. It's set during the miners' strike, and it's about uh, a group of gay rights activists from, from London who set up a solidarity campaign of sorts for striking miners in some small town in, or a village, some mining village in Wales. And they travel to that place and, uh, uh, well, then they're in for a bit of a cultural shock because it turns out the miners are actually quite socially conservative. They, uh, they are not that keen on having gay rights activists in their town. And most of the movie is about this cultural clash that uh, there's, there's not much of a story. It's, it's, it's really just uh, this contrast. Uh, that's, well, that's what the movie is about. But ultimately, they form a coalition of sorts because what they have in common is they hate Thatcherite economics. They see that as the worst thing that could happen to the country and that's what, what unites them. Uh, and that was true then, certainly true in the 80s. If you agreed on economics, you were part of the same team doesn't matter whether you're a London hipster or a Welsh coal miner, you form a coalition on that basis. And it would be hard to imagine a sequel to the movie Pride today. Of course, you could imagine you could show um, hip Corbynistas, you could show Ash Sarkar and Owen Jones traveling to some uh, post-industrial northern town, but I don't think they would um, <laughs> form a coalition as easily as the people in, in the movie Pride would. And it's, it's funny when you talk about counterculture and it seems to me that it's come to the point where maybe it's social conservatives and free marketeers that are now the uh, counterculture. Do you see that this movement might, or this, uh, uh, this sort of progressive movement may end up tearing itself apart? As you mentioned earlier in your answer, they've attributed different, um, well, being articulate to being to being white, which to me is very much a new type of racism. So do you think that the contradictions there may well end up tearing the movement apart and people, uh, there'll be a wider, broader public backlash that hasn't quite yet built up the momentum? Um, no. <laughs> yes, so there, there will certainly be, we will certainly be, see more instances of the revolution eating its children. Mm. Uh, a lot of the people who got cancelled or, or at least no platform and um, whatever are themselves fairly progressive people that they, they just didn't uh, exactly keep up with the woke terminology of of the day I and mean, Germaine Greer was a, a feminist icon for decades and uh, just said something can't, can't remember what it was uh, probably something about trans rights that, that was just not quite up to uh, in line with the, the progressive opinion of the day and uh, faced a backlash over that and, and got no platform in various places. So that will happen, that uh, so the, the people who are leaders of the, the woke revolution today might get cancelled tomorrow, but I just don't think they will learn the lesson. Ideally, you would come to a, 
a truth you, you would you would say okay this this we've gone a bit too far uh, let's slow things down a bit but um, there are no signs of that happening yet and I, I don't really think it will I think it, it will be uh, every new cohort will just think this won't happen to me um, they will still think no I can't get cancelled it, it can't happen to me yeah. so, uh, I'm, yeah. I'm on the cancelling side everything's fine <laughs> so if um, um, looking to our job as a free market think tank um, what challenges do you think this whole conversation creates for free marketeers and any opportunities if as you say the culture wars does have an economic basis what can we do yeah um, what, what we can do is um, we can talk about, I mean, it's, it's, we shouldn't uh, abandon economics and become the Institute of, of Culture Wars. Mm -hmm. uh, but we can look at the overlap uh, in instances where culture warriors are bringing up economic arguments, even if it's in a latent way. Those are topics that we can pick up on. Um, like the the colony the uh, the colonialism issue that, that we talked about that 's something you could imagine i e a publications um, along those lines that would be very much in line with with our core mission that would not mean abandoning dropping what we do and and doing something completely different. It would just be driven by by a change in demand. I guess uh, 10 years ago, if somebody had suggested uh, that, that maybe the, the IEA should talk about the, the effects of colonialism, um, I, I guess the, the response would have been, why, that's such a niche topic, nobody's interested in that. Whereas today, it would be obvious why, why that would be topical. Uh, so in, in, in that sense, it, could, it can lead to a, a different, a choice of different, different topics. But it's, it would still be very much in line with the core mission of a, of a free market uh, think tank to uh, talk about those big picture issues. I, I think what we have to do is, is simply not just talk about uh, economics in the, in the purely technical sense, uh, reacting to budget statements uh, and, and autumn statements and, 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 and OBR forecasts. Uh, it's not just about uh, commenting on this change in the rate of that tax uh, or that regulation, but also the, the broad system level questions because uh, groups like, like Black Lives Matter uh, have a clear anti-capitalist message they say on their fundraising page uh, our our goal or our our objective is to overthrow capitalism so that's that's an economic argument that they're making there and this is something that we we can respond to we can we can talk about the differences between economic systems um, we we can talk about whether it really is true that the uh, the the grievances that they have uh, are related to capitalism, whether there would be any whether there would be any less of that in a different economic system, which uh, I, I really don 't believe at all uh, or, or the same with extinction rebellion that um, i mean yeah they, they put out a statement last week or, or two weeks ago where, where they said we are not a socialist organization, but then are they really uh, if if ninety nine percent of your uh, followers are are socialists. Then you are a socialist organization, whether whether you call yourself that or not. And uh, th their their message has very much been the whole time that uh, a, a capitalist economy cannot deal with climate change, and that that we we need to overthrow capitalism. Uh, we need a totally different type of economic system, and and that is very much something where where we have a lot to, uh, to say on it. Where where we can say, hang on, there have been alternatives to capitalism. Look at their environmental record. Uh, what makes you think that that is the way to go? Or um, or just more more to the point, uh, if if you just 
nationalize or collectivize lots of private companies? How is that going to affect their carbon footprint? Uh, you still have the same technology. Uh, it's got nothing to do with who owns the companies, whether that's the whether that's private owners or the state or some some other institution. Um, got nothing to do with that. So we, we can very much take on those quasi-economic arguments that they're making. And I think we have a lot to say on those issues. So maybe the IEA doesn't quite need a culture wars unit, but it's something that we'll be, uh, we'll talk about when we're talking about wider economic issues for sure. Thank you so much for joining me, Christian. Um, oh, thank you. Thank you. If you enjoyed this video, please do give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. Thanks for watching.